on this edition of Southern Newsweek. The historic Kingston Flyer steam train is back on track after a lengthy hiatus. 37 people who lost their lives at New Zealand workplaces have been remembered on Workers' Day. And a group of King's High School pupils and supporters spent a day making nearly 40,000 cheese rolls. Kia ora, I'm Melissa Barton. About 180 people made history yesterday morning, becoming the first passengers on board the Kingston Flyer in more than eight years. The historic steam train is one of the highlights of the Great Southern Train Tour, a tourist enterprise which organisers say has a lot of room to grow. After an eight-year break, the Kingston Flyer is back chugging along the almost 14 kilometres of track between Fairlight and Kingston, south of Lake Wakatipu. Yesterday and today, hundreds of participants in the Great Southern Train Tour rode the steam train as one of the highlights in a huge heritage trip across the South Island. We're running two tours simultaneously. Um, one started in Christchurch with the Transalpine over to Franz Joseph, two nights in Queenstown, um, Kingston Flyer, two nights in Tiano, then in, through to Invercargill where they're going to um, disembark on two 1950s heritage uh, locomotives double heading out of uh, Invercargill, all the way through to Kaikoura. They'll stop again along the way at uh, Dunedin, Oamaru um, and Christchurch. And then north of Kaikoura on AB608, the Passchendaele, um, they'll be steaming all the way um, along the Blue Pacific coastline uh, through the uh, Awateri Valley, dissecting the Dashwood um, Pass into Blenheim. The flyer has operated off and on as a tourist attraction between Kingston and Fairlight. In 2011 it was revived by the late David Bryce, with restorations costing more than one million dollars. But it ran for only two summers and was mothballed until investors bought the train and associated land and buildings in 2017. Jackson says his Ponamu Tourism Group is modelling its train tours on similar experiences on offer in Britain. If you draw a comparison with the UK where um, heritage um, injects millions and millions of pounds you know, into the economy, this has inspired us to do a lot more of it. Jackson says once accommodation, meals and the excursions themselves are added up, the two tours of various rail journeys are injecting about $2 million into the South Island economy, and he's confident there's room to grow. There's plenty of room for more of this, and um, New Zealand is rich with um, heritage attractions like the Kingston Fire, the, the Urns Law, uh, the Transport Museums, you know, the list goes on. And, um, and it's something that people really want to see and do. Jackson also says the Flyers engineer Neville Simpson has put in a huge amount of work on the rolling stock, locomotives and carriages, as well as clearing the tracks and replacing sleepers. In Kingston, the South today. 37 people lost their lives at work between May last year and January this year across the country. International Workers' Day is commemorated around the world, with the service being held in Dunedin. Crosses have been laid at Dunedin's Workers' Memorial, representing the 37 people who went to work across the nation and lost their lives while on the job. On April 28th, Workers' Memorial Day, working people around the world remember those killed at work. 37 people lost their lives at work between May 2020 and January 2021. Air 2 Union National Co-President Don Pride says everyone should always get home to their families at the end of the workday. And this day shouldn't have to happen. Yeah, you're absolutely right. In an ideal world we wouldn't, but unfortunately it's not an ideal world. And people are still going to work and dying at work. We average probably just, just over one a week. And it's just not good enough. The number, as Marion Hobbs said before, the number should be zero. But today gives us a chance to reflect upon the ones that have have died at work and not come home. Member of Parliament for Tsairi, Ingrid Leary, was amongst those reading out the names of people who died at workplaces around New Zealand. She outlines the stark reality of the number of crosses around the memorial. Every single one of those crosses represented a mother, father, brother, sister, son, daughter who didn't come home from work. So those families were expecting their loved one to come back at the end of the day and those people, for whatever reason, had an unsafe workplace place and didn't make it home. 
it's hard to believe that's still happening this day and age. It shows how much more work there is to do for us to make workplaces safer, but also to make sure that workers have rights and are valued. International Workers Day is recognised around the globe and commonly used as a memorial day to remember people who went to work one day and never came home. In Dunedin, the South Today. Public Anzac commemorations have been held across the nation. COVID-19 restrictions forced the cancellation of public gatherings last year. Dunedin's dawn service was well attended under, at times, fiery southern sky. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, service personnel were remembered again. Those who've served, past and present, marched to Dunedin's cenotaph on a cold and dark morning. Chaplain Captain Aaron Knox questioned what a life of service means. Kia ora. Good morning and welcome. As we assemble here together this Anzac morning, I invite us all to remember, to reflect and to renew. And the sound of a 25-pound gun echoed through Dunedin's central streets, marking 106 years since the Anzacs landed on the shores of Gallipoli. It was a different picture to last year, when New Zealanders had to pay their respects from their letterboxes and lounge rooms during the COVID-19 Level 4 lockdown. Captain Knox asked those gathered about last year's commemorations. Where were you standing at dawn this time last year? Amidst the uncertainty of a global pandemic, where are our people serving in 2021? The Anzac address was given by New Zealand Defence Force Colonel Kate Lee, who remembered the men and women who served and honoured those who continue to keep New Zealanders safe. Service then, as it is now, is representative of a funeral service, of mourning, of respect and of remembrance. This act of remembrance has sadly come to represent more loss, sacrifice and service since the landings at Gallipoli. Anthems were played as the sun began to rise, with the service wrapping up with wreath laying and the playing of the last post. In Dunedin, the South Today. A Dunedin High School rugby team sat down and did a half day's work in the school kitchen recently. The task for King's High School pupils was to produce more than 40,000 cheese rolls to raise funds for their team. It might be the school holidays, but these members of Dunedin's King's High School first 15 rugby team, plus family and friends, were back at school, filling pre-orders of cheese rolls as a fundraiser for the team. The, uh, the official number is that we've got uh, 3,512 dozen uh, cheese rolls uh, being made. Uh, so that equates to around 44,000 44, individual uh, cheese rolls. Uh, at this stage of the day we're, we're about two thirds of the way there. Um, be a, it's been a long day uh, so far but the boys are sticking to the task and um, again we get to the end of the day around 7, 8 o'clock I think tonight and they can look back and think a job well done. The fundraiser is designed to offset some of the costs of travel and uniforms for the rugby season which their manager Darren Smith says can easily reach $25,000 for the team. It's a pretty uh, busy yet expensive um, undertaking that um, our boys have, having the privilege of being in the first 15. Uh, the purpose also is to ensure that their, their parents and caregivers are not continually having to uh, you know, put their hand in their pockets. Smith says the day spent in the school's food tech room is an opportunity for the boys to build character through mahi, or hard work. You know, we want our boys to be uh, working hard, uh, not, not expecting that you know, their parents and their caregivers are always going to be the ones to, I guess, write that check. Um, there's, there's a greater satisfaction, I think, for our kids today to actually be uh, working and, um, and I think they'll, they'll reap the rewards later on when they reflect on that as well. The team are set to play their traditional inter-school rugby match against Waitaki Boys High School next Wednesday. In Dunedin, the South today. Still to come on Southern Newsweek, a southern animal attraction is under scrutiny. While New Zealand's duck population should listen carefully to calls as duck shooting season begins. So catch this and more after the break.
Welcome back. A new petting zoo near Mosgiel is home to everything from emus to fawns, plus farm animals which have been rescued from ne neglect. But the wildlife home is now under investigation by the SBCA after the park's keepers were contacted regarding animal welfare concerns at the property. This farm on Dukes Road near Mosgiel is a home to a wide range of animals that have been rescued from unhappy situations. Called the Animal Ark, the farm fulfills the lifelong dream of Kelly Linnell to save animals from neglect. It's just been my goal my whole life to have a farm, pretty much, and um, to have a place where I can have animals and no one can tell me that I have to get rid of them, I guess. The park is open for the public to enjoy the animals and for the animals to enjoy the treats being fed by the public. But Linnell's dream has been soured by an SPCA investigation into allegations of animal mistreatment. She strongly denies the accusations, saying they're degrading and upsetting. She says the farm has rescued many animals, such as these Angora goats, from people who did not know how to take care of them properly. The particular breed of goat that he was using was Angora, and Angora are not known to be a meat breed uh, anyway. They're a wool breed. They are shorn obviously for Angora fleece. Uh, they don't put on a lot of weight and unfortunately he didn't have any grounds or grass that would be suitable for goats anyway. So when we picked them up they were literally skin and bone. Um, they weighed less than 10 kgs each for an adult goat and they should weigh between 35 and 40 kgs. Uh, the SPCA basically gave me 48 hours to kind of try and get them at least onto some sort of turnaround um, but as the vet said that they would probably be dead within 48 hours. Um, they both survived thankfully which is really good. The SPCA says it's investigating the park but cannot comment further while the investigation is underway. In Dunedin, the South Today. Personal lubricated lips were a requirement for those taking part in the annual duck callers of the world competition. 13 people competed under the watchful eyes of the judges, with organisers saying the taere was well represented at the Mornington Tap House. The duck callers of the world duck calling competition has been held at Dunedin's Mornington Tap House. The annual event has been held for about 20 years and proprietor David Miskilling says it's a great way to prepare for the season. A bit of a warm up so the guys vocals can get well plumbed up and uh, practice so on the day they're calling those ducks in from a long distance away and enjoying the shoot. Competitors took to the cover behind the Mai Mai at the Tap House's downstairs event bar with five-year-old Hamiyota Smith giving it a quack. <laughs> Miss Kimming says following last night's warm-up and well-mannered competition, the hunters would be gearing up for the start of the duck hunting season. So the guys from, from here, they'll be, uh, they've probably already made their my minds up and they'll be uh, starting to pack up their essential um, gears, which will, but might have a bit of liquid in it, probably not that much, but also their, all their camo gear and all their shells um, and all their decoys and get them all laid out in the pond, ready to go. Judges look on as would-be duck hunters duck into the Mai Mai using an attempt at animal magnetism and well-pursed lips to lure a flying feed. The skimming shows the array of duck calling devices hunters can choose from. The, uh, so this is yeah, quite a range. Um, they come in from, they're called parries, uh, the parry caller, that one there, and then the standard old quacker. And the boys are way better than that than I am. According to Fishing Games website, the duck shooting seasons vary across the country, but it's due to get underway nationwide on May the 1st. In Dunedin, the South Today. University of Otago researchers have discovered Māori may have been growing kumara in coastal Otago nearly 400 years ago. These days sweet potato is typically grown in the North Island, with Dargaville in the Northland known as the kumara capital of New Zealand. Looking into the past with a microscope, University of Otago Associate Professor Ian Barber has just published findings in the respected international publication PLOS One, showing kumara were grown by Māori at Purakonui, 200 kilometres further south than previously thought possible. In this instance there are indeed granules of starch which 
from the base of the pits, which have all the characteristics of sweet potato. And from the point of view of chronology, we now have very, very accurate uh, radiocarbon dating that uh, indicates to us that the pits were constructed and used within the period 1430 to 1460 AD, or CE, Common Era. So that's, uh, that's quite exciting. The site near Dunedin was excavated about 20 years ago. But Barber says back in the early 2000s, they didn't quite have the technology to fully study Kumara pits. Associate Professor Barber says the southern climate was a limiting factor. But researchers aren't ruling out other southern Kumara storage or even growing sites in Otago. But we uh, also should acknowledge that in later Māori records and later ethnographic records there, is no, there are no references to the local storage of Kumara with one exception uh, with a record from uh, Huriawa Peninsula which is very interesting in and of itself, a very a relatively warm microclimate. So while there could be more, we think that um, climate down here was a limiting factor and that over time climate and possibly climate deterioration associated with the so-called Little Ice Age that impacted uh, the Southern Hemisphere after 1500 CE could have discouraged um, more storage features uh, for Kumara in the far south and potentially uh, any microclimate production that may have occurred down here. Baba specialises in New Zealand Māori and Māori Ori archaeology at the University of Otago and is at pains to thank Southern Tangata Whenua for their help and support for the project. He says there's both oral tradition and early journaling about sweet potato crops in the south. We worked um, closely with and we had the interest and support of uh, the local Runaka, Kati Huirapa, Kite Pukitaraki, and, and I really want to acknowledge um, Suzanne Allison there and also the uh, Purakanui Māori block uh, and the current chair of that block, and Nicola Taylor, who have been very interested and supportive. And um, with that interest and support, I was aware that there were um, local traditions that in fact mentioned uh, Kumara, and some of those traditions suggested that there may have been a Kumara presence down here. There's a, a manuscript, for example, from that I alluded to before, uh, or at least a result, that a, a report in a manuscript I alluded to before from Hugh Carrington, the journalist uh, who compiled a Naitahu history in the 1930s and he, um, according to that history, noted that uh, the pa at Huriawa Peninsula near Karatane, um, which was under the uh, <coughs> the, uh, the management of uh, Tewera, uh, that the Kumara was stored at that pa during a siege of the pa by Tewera's relative Taoka. So that was a, an, an interesting tradition and there are other traditions about uh, Kumara Atua associated or gods associated with the pa there, the Huriawa our peninsula pa, um, uh, a deity in particular by the name of Roko or Rongo Nui Atou, and Roko or Rongo is the god of Kumara, and so he's identified at Huriawa. There's another early account that even um, suggests that there may have been cultivations there. As well as the discovery of Kumara being stored 200 kilometres further south than originally thought, Barber says narrowing the storage dates down to 30 years shows the calibre of the state-of-the-art technology the team used for the research. In Dunedin, the South Today. Still to come on Southern Newsweek, youngsters have been shown how to care for wildlife with the help of their teddies, while at the other end of life, two elderly residents in a Mosgiel care facility have celebrated another lap around the sun. So see you after the break. Thanks for staying with us. Dunedin youngsters were given the opportunity to learn how to bandage their soft toys should they become injured. Staff from Dunedin's Wildlife Hospital used it as a way for children to learn what the local wildlife hospital does for injured native birds and animals. How do you mend a teddy bear with a broken arm? Jordana White was one of several at the Otago Museum showing youngsters some of the bandaging techniques that are performed at the charity Wildlife Hospital. It's just uh, an activity that we can actually do with young children to kind of get, get them interested in the Wildlife Hospital and uh, working with uh, injured animals. 
and so we can't bring them into the hospital so we try to bring an activity to them. White says staff at the Dunedin Wildlife Hospital cater for all manner of injured animals, with some species being more regularly seen at the facility than others. So our most frequently admitted patients would be hoiho, yellow-eyed penguins, and our second most frequently admitted are the kereru, uh, the wood pigeons. So those would be, uh, actually quite often it's members of the public that find those injured animals first, so those two species would be quite common to find. When they're not taking part in community engagement exercises such as this one, the hospital staff are busy looking after injured and sick wildlife across the southern region. Wildlife Hospital has been around for about three years now. Uh, we treat about 600 native species patients per year. Uh, we are a charitable institution so we um, do rely on donations and grants um, from the public which we deeply appreciate. Um, yeah and we serve most of the southern South Island. Called Wildlife ER, the event was run as part of the Wild Dunedin Festival. In Dunedin, the South today. Not many of us are lucky enough to receive a birthday card from the Queen on our 100th birthday. But two residents living in a Mosgill care facility received theirs three or four years ago and are still going strong. Elma McRobbie on the left and Vi Byers on the right are two residents at Birchley Residential Care Unit in Mosgill being photographed for their upcoming 104th and 103rd birthdays respectively. Staff say they're impressed with the personalities of their residents. Well, it is very enter entertaining in more ways than you could imagine. I like all people. Um, Vi is actually very good. She's a very affectionate person. She likes cuddles. She likes kisses, as you would have imagined. She likes her cup of soup at tea time. <laughs> would have at least two, three of them. Got gorgeous family. Very supportive, loves fish and chips on a Saturday. Spot on, never missed a Saturday of fish and chips. Um, and she just, you know, talks really quite well with um, the residents and staff. They love her. Elma amazes me, like entirely. I mean, the fact that she had two hip surgeries and hip replacement and managed to bounce back in a reached home level. You could just tell she's really doing something amazing in there somewhere. And the fact that 104, she's still emailing family members. Elma McRobbie suggests her longevity may be due to an active childhood and always having had a youthful appearance. I never sort of thought much about my age at all. In fact, I was never taken um, for my age. I've always been thought I was younger than I was. Mm. But she says there isn't really a good explanation as to why she's done so well. There's really no right rhyme or reason. My heart's always been very good. Uh, I, and just looking after yourself, being intentional. The pair are the two oldest residents at Birchley. In Mosgill, the South today. The five-day Arrowtown Autumn Festival kicked off with crowds turning out for the opening events. The festival features all manner of entertainment both indoors as well as outdoors among the autumn coloured trees. Timed to coincide with the stunning autumnal colours on the surrounding hills, Arrowtown's 36th Autumn Festival has kicked off with a bang. A large crowd was entertained during the official opening, which included juggling and gymnastic performances from Christchurch's mullet man and his partner Mim. Arrowtown's Athenaeum Hall filled up for the annual Senior Citizens Afternoon Tea Party, with period music hall entertainment, complete with can-can dancers of all ages. About 130 Wakatipu residents attended this year's event and drank the hall dry within an hour, meaning festival volunteers had to run to the nearest liquor store to collect more bottles of sherry to help wet the whistles of the guests. The five-day festival runs until Monday, with displays of vintage cars and outdoor activities for both young and old. In Arrowtown, the South today. On a recent cold stormy day at Kettle Park, Zingaree Richmond beat Dunedin by just one point in a scrum dominated rugby match. Zingaree's 17 16 win could prove to be a morale booster for the struggling club. 
Welcome to ODT Rugby Chat, Peter at Kittle Park. We just watched a massive boil over here today. Um, Zingari have won this game 17 points to 16. Uh, I felt they were the better side today for the, for the majority of the game. In fact, I think they should have won by more. I and mean, right here, I've got Chris Bell. He's played about seven and a half million games for Zingari. Um, and he's beaten and he's beaten Dunedin twice in the last three years at Kittle Park. So 17-16, mate. Talk me through how you won that game. Uh, grit and determination, mate. It's 80 minutes of just absolute grit and determination. When you come out against a side like that, against the Sharks, mate, you've got to give it all for 80. Otherwise, you're just going to get under the pump straight away. So, look, I mean, I, I felt the difference in the game was, was was the passion and the passion and the vigour that you especially displayed the forward pack. You, I think you totally outplayed that Dunedin forward pack today, and that's where you won the game. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I think it was. It was uh, just about getting a start under our belt, and then we could play off that passion. I mean, once we got some front football and show we could actually do it, it was finding that and keeping it going, and that's what got us over the line in the end. And, and just quickly, at the end there, when you took those scrums, you didn't actually think about, about taking that penalty shot for goal at the end? No, it just our scrum was going good all game, so we kept them under the pressure. I mean, if we kicked the penalty goal, we're only up by four, and they put us under pressure to only hear one mistake, they're back on the line again. So we just keep the pressure on with our scrum and just hold on to the ball, and it's what we did all game, and it's what we did well, so we just stuck to it. Okay, mate, well done. Excellent work. So there it is, all over here, 17-16, Zingari beat Dunedin, and we'll be back with you again next week. And that wraps up this edition of Southern News Week. For the latest news from the Southern region, head online to odt.co.nz and follow Channel 39 on Facebook and YouTube. Ka kite anō. Supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand on air.